Okay, I made the triangle of dots because if you follow this numerical scheme, I computed, this tells me to compute ui n plus 1, which is the value here, from the variable 2 and variable 3, which is the value at these two open circles, right? And if, but how is the value at this open circle computed? It is computed according to the same scheme, except for n plus 1 is replaced by n, and uh, n is replaced by n minus 1, which means this value is computed from these two values. And this value, which is the same scheme, but n is replaced by n minus 1, n replaced, so n plus 1 replaced by n, n replaced by n minus 1, and also i replaced by i minus 1, i minus 1 replaced by i minus 2. So this is computed by this value and this value. And you can use the same logic forward and forward and forward. So this is going to be computed using these four points and etc. So I, every single point that lies in this triangle, if I change the value of the solution there, it is going to change the value of the solution at this point. So this is the numerical domain of dependence of this point. And uh, the CFL condition says that this triangle must include this ray which is the physical or analytical domain of dependence. All right, so why does it make sense? It makes sense because uh, in order for me to get the solution at a particular point, I need to know what happened along this line, right? If the numerical domain of dependence doesn't even include this line, then the numerical procedure doesn't even know what the solution should be. So how can it actually calculate the solution, right? The, the, the result is the uh, scheme is going to be unstable. It doesn't even work. And uh, this puts a severe restriction on what time step size we can use. So for example, here, uh, here, let's compute what the slope of this line is. The slope of, uh, uh, what is the slope of the numerical domain of dependence? Hmm? Delta, T delta T over delta x is the is the slope of numerical domain of dependence, right? What is the slope of the physical domain of dependence? U, U, common mistake. U, are you sure the slope is U? So if u is 0, the lines are going to be horizontal or vertical? Vertical, right? So if u is 0, the, slides are, the, the, the slope is going to be infinite. 1 over u, that's right. So 1 over u is the slope of the physical domain of dependence. So the Numerical domain of dependence has to include the physical domain of dependence, which means the numerical domain of dependence has to be shallow, right? So delta t over delta x has to be less or equal to the magnitude of 1 over u, which means delta t has to be less or equal to what? Uh, delta x over magnitude of u. Okay, the f so, so two things. One is that if I decrease my delta x, I have to decrease my delta t in a proportional way. Okay, that's actually, for, for the advection equation, is actually a less stringent restriction as what we saw in the heat equation two lectures, I mean, one lecture before or two lectures before, right? Which, for heat equation, if we use explicit scheme, then delta t has to be proportional to delta x squared. So for this equation, delta t only has to be proportional to, to delta x, which is acceptable. Yes? Oh, sorry, I just had a question about the CFL condition. Is it sort of the same as saying that your time step has to be small enough that the solution doesn't move more than one greater point every time step? Yes, the solution doesn't move over more than one grid point per time step. That's right. That's right, exactly. That's another very good way to say it. All right, so delta t has to be less than that. All right, and uh, the smaller delta x is, the smaller your delta t is proportionally. 
the faster your wave is, also you have to make smaller delta t, right? So, so this is a uh, this is for linear linear equation. The wave speed is constant. As we are soon will go to nonlinear equations, we are going to see the wave speed, or, or in nonlinear equation, is called the characteristic wave speed. It's going to be non-constant. It depends on where you are, what the solution is doing at the moment. So your delta t has to be less than delta x over the magnitude of u for any u, like for all the u's you can observe anywhere in the domain, which is going to change depending on location and the time. So you, I mean, a lot of solvers, they do adaptive time stepping. You change your delta t according to what the solution is doing exactly for this reason. Yes? Does ODE45 account for this? ODE45 actually doesn't even know what your delta x is. So it tries to guess what delta t is, uh, basically using accuracy criterions instead of uh, stability criterions. So if your uh, solution is unstable, it will not, most likely not going to be accurate. So OD45 is going to catch most of the cases where your solution is going to be unstable. But you can't be like 100% sure. I don't think you can ever be 100% sure if you don't know your, what, what your delta x is, yeah. So OD45 is going to be pretty good uh, uh, for most of the cases. All right. Uh, so so it also de defines your CFL condition. Uh, CFL number, sorry, sorry. Usually it's just called CFL. It's going to be the ratio of this number and this number. So delta T over delta X times the magnitude of U. Right. So it's basically how much you are satisfying. If if the left hand side and right hand side are exactly equal, CFL number is going to be one. If your delta t is half as large as what is ma what uh, the maximum value for its stability criterion, then CFL is going to be 0.5. Okay. So that's that. And uh, uh, what else? Oh yeah, for nonlinear equations, or for nonlinear equations, it's the delta t times the maximum over the entire domain of a u divided by delta x. So, so this is uh, taking into consideration of that u may be different for different locations, and the delta x, if you are using a non-uniform grid, is going to be also different in different locations. So look at delta x at every grid point, look at u at every grid point, you take the maximum, that's going to be your CFL condition. And you want to, uh, that's going to be your self L number. And uh, if you're using forward order and uh, uh, and uh, just the one point upward difference, you want to make sure your self L number is less than one. Okay. There are cases where your self L can be greater than one. For example, if you use something more complicated than forward order, wronger card schemes, you can use a self L number greater than one, two, or something, it's going to be fine. If you use a spatial discretization that depend on more than the neighboring grid point. For example, if you use your spatial discretization that is related to also u of i minus 2, then your, uh, then, your, uh, then your numerical domain of dependence is going to have a shallower slope, right? That also uh, enables you potentially of using a self L number greater than 1. Make sense? OK. Uh, you can. You can do von Neumann stability analysis to also convince yourself that this is exactly the condition. If you do upwind difference and forward order, this is the exact condition you have to satisfy. Uh, it's basically kind of a routine application of the von Neumann stability analysis. I, I just uh, want to go through that uh, in class. So if you if you learned uh, if I successfully taught you how to do von Neumann stability analysis, you should be able to do that uh, at home. All right. Any questions on the CFL condition? That's the last thing we're going to be talking about for linear advection equation. You can find a difference.